Thank you. And then also, uh, just a reminder of the missions table back there and, and some of the things are on there. Uh, we keep some articles on there and then as we get new issues of Voice of the Martyrs, I put that back there and I know you don't have time to read it, but at least to just look at the pictures, some and look in the eyes and faces yeah. of some of those people. And then I talked to Pastor John. One of the things we're going to start doing probably in February on the third Sunday, Lord willing, is that the old magazines that we get, because the church gets them and, and, and I get them, what I'm going to start doing, and, and uh, I have to feel like the Lord just kind of had to slap me up the backside of the head and say, why haven't you done this before? But I'm going to make the old issues, because they come monthly, and just put them on the table back there, and then if you want to take one and, and look at it or read some of the articles, they would, believe me, they will encourage you in circum whatever circumstances you are in about how God brings peace and victory even when it looks impossible and even in fact when there's not going to be necessarily a physical victory but be a spiritual one in spite of persecution and in spite of opposition and even in spite of death that yet God brings victory and so uh, starting next month I'll just make those old, old issues and then if you want to bring it back and We'll put it on the table again, but they are so encouraging to see what God is doing to the lives of people in places where they have opposition that we can't even hardly imagine, and yet God grants victory and peace. So anyway, we're going to start doing that. So anyway, reminder about if you get leave, if you have an offering for Papua New Guinea, it's back on that little offering plate is back there on the, on the table to do that. This morning, what I want to share with you, uh, the title is, He's Not a Baby Anymore. And uh, this, something the Lord did in my own heart, uh, I, in fact, I think it was before Linda ever went home to be with the Lord, but uh, after Christmas, we have a tendency to put away the decorations, and one of the things I've noticed on, on the street I live in, Hayesville, that one of the, the people that for a long time have put up a, a uh, put up the manger scene and all of that, what I've noticed is they really have left it up and leaving it lit, and I sure like it when I drive by and see it, so it's made me think maybe maybe next year I'll leave some of mine up and leave it on every once in a while till Easter when I put out the lighted cross, but at any rate, uh, a lot of things uh, about Christmas and then you get past the New Year's and the New Year's pledges if you make them and then, then struggle with whether you're going to keep them or break them or however long that takes and then try to get on with it. And it made me think about dealing with Jesus because at Christmas, we think of this infant who came and the tremendous miracle, all that is for Jesus to step down out of that creative realm and then come in Mary's womb by the Holy Spirit and then be born a baby. And I can think of, of the time Michelle was five and a half months so we brought her home, we adopted her about having a, a baby girl uh, in our home uh, for the first time and all that, and, and about how that you think of Jesus as a baby, and you think, well, that's great. God gave his son and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then you can just kind of keep him as a baby and just kind of keep him that way, and you can control him as a parent does a child to a degree because you get to control you know, feeding them and diapering them and all those kind of things. And yet they eventually grow up. And as all parents know, sometimes it gets a lot more difficult to control them. Uh, and you're not in control anymore. So we like to think of things that we can keep control of. Well, Jesus grew up also. Now, the difference was he was without sin. And the scriptures that were put in the bulletin if you want to look at them sometime, if you haven't read them, are about two stages. There are comments that are made about Jesus by Luke, about Jesus as he was as he was growing up. And one of them says, and the child, and I'll read it from the bullet, and the child grew and became strong and spiritful of wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And then later on, in the end of the chapter, and after an event I'm going to mention, uh, that... Uh, 
when Jesus was 12, they took him to Jerusalem for the Passover and all that. And if you want to read the story in Luke, and, and then he went and, and got into the discussion. They didn't, Mary and Joseph didn't know where he was. And they got into a discussion with the big shots at the, at the temple and was talking to them. And anyway, so then they found him. And they asked the parent, every parent would say, you know, where have you been? Why did you put us through this? We didn't have any idea where you were. And that's this Jesus going up into this person that, that I'm gonna, we're going to share this morning in the, in the scriptures that you know. And he makes a statement, didn't you know that I was going to be about my father's business? Now, Joseph was his earthly stepfather, as it were, but he was going to be about his father's business, and as John has been teaching us in, in uh, the Gospel of John on Sunday nights, everything that Jesus has been doing as he relates so many things refers back to the father because that's who he's in submission to, and that's whose direction he is following. And so as he grows up and then becomes that person, Jesus becomes the person who is going to tell us some things, and we're going to look at that this morning. We're going to, we're going to start with some of the really what I consider good things to hear. Then we're going to go to some things that aren't so comfortable to hear that he said. And then we're going to do like, a, a, like they teach you if, you if you take psychology or counseling or dealing with people that you start with good things and then you deal with the tough stuff and then you go back to dealing with good things and uh, Linda always taught me this from classes she took in college that if you have to deal with people that you you tell them something good so they feel comfortable then you deal with the difficulty uh, like you might have to do with a child or an employee and then you go back to something good and so that's what I want to finish with but it's about dealing with this person Jesus of Nazareth King of kings, Lord of lords, the one who's the same yesterday, today, and forever, to look at, yes, he says some things that are really tough to deal with, but he also says some things that will give us the strength to deal with that and to live with that and to start living it out, and not only that, to live it out knowing that he is our victory and we are conquerors, more than conquerors, to him who loved us, as the Apostle Paul said. So that's what I want to do this, this morning is talk about this person who's not a baby anymore and just some of the things that he said and just, just let them hopefully penetrate us so that whatever is ahead for us, knowing that for some of us it's been really tough and we may have some tough things coming in the future and some big question marks that are over us and yet Jesus has said things that for those who will accept him as Savior that he has promised to do even in the difficult situations and even in some of the difficult statements that he said will give us the victory. And not only that, assure us that whether we can see it right now or not, the victory is assured. Just like our salvation is assured even if we're going through a struggle. So... Anyway, he must be about the Father's business. And by the way, as we think about that in our own lives, ultimately the peace and victory that we want to have and see in us and in our family or in our church or whatever comes when we are more and more about the Father's business and what he is leading us to do than it is about ours. And that's how the victory really comes. And so we're just going to look at some of that this morning. Um, we'll put the first one on, on the overhead. But as many as received him, and this is John chapter 1, and you know this, and, and Pastor John has been teaching on this or has in the past. Many as received to them, he gave the right, and that word can be translated authority, to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of the blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And so as many as received him, and that's Jesus. And so I'm praying that all of us here have, or anybody listening, and if you haven't, 
You receive Jesus by just accepting him and say, Father, forgive me of my sins. I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and I give my life to you. And then it says when we do that, we have authority. That word means authority or privilege to be God's children. And then not only that, we receive grace and truth. And grace is God's unmerited favor or God's riches at Christ's expense. And then one of the other important things we receive is truth. And there's probably not a more serious need for truth in all of our lives as there is right now. And, and because I'm old enough to remember the 60s when that was also a tough thing to find. And so we need to come back to Jesus and hopefully maybe have a Jesus movement start again and have it based on the truth, but the truth is who he is. Because one of the I am's is I am the way, the truth, and the life. So we receive grace and truth through Jesus because we're now born in a spiritual kingdom. So that's one of the good things. We receive grace and truth and we come become God's children. And when we accept Jesus, irrespective of the difficult circumstances we are in, to remember, I'm one of God's kids. And he gave everything in his son for me. And Satan cannot take that from me. The IRS cannot take it from me. Down power lines cannot take it from me. Loss of a job cannot take it from me. I am his child forevermore. And so that's one of, that's one of the things that, that Jesus teaches us. And then let's go to the next one. And as Moses, and we know this, this is from John chapter 3, and, and the verse, most well-known verse in the Bible, by most people's standards, comes from this. And Moses, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life or eternal life. God gave his Son, and if we believe in him, then we have everlasting life. Now, we're going to look at some other statements that Jesus is going to make to realize that everlasting life is not contingent on this physical body. Because one of the things that's going to happen to everyone, unless we're those who are alive and remain, when Jesus comes back, is we're going to lay this body down, death, however you want to call it, but this body will cease. But those who believe in him, who accept him, are going to have everlasting life life and it cannot be taken from us and then go to John 8 51 most assuredly I say to you if anyone keeps my word he shall never see death and yet it's going to be beyond living here in this thing and not only that we have the hope of the fact that even when we lay this down and Paul says anybody that does that they believed in Jesus, they are with him. Yeah. And then we have a promise that we're going to get a new one of these. Yes. Amen. And maybe by then I'll be able to get a new pair of Burke shoes and go running again if God lets me and I want to. Yeah. Who knows, maybe I'll do another marathon somewhere yeah. down the road in eternity. Yes. Yeah. Amen. Or do one of those really stupid things, do one of those 50 milers. Oh, my goodness, does that sound good. He said, you got to be crazy. Yes, I am. Uh, you got to be crazy to ever do anything like that. But we're gonna, we're, that, that's the promise that we're going to have that. If we keep his word, we will never see death. And that does not mean this. It means that for eternity, we're going to live for him. And then he goes on to say, and I don't have this up there, but when he's dealing with the death of, of Lazarus and Mary and Martha, and he's going to the family, and yes, he is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He's been dead three days, but he's going to raise him from the dead. And yet he, what he tells before that happens is, you know, I am the res one of the, the great I, the seven great I am's in John. I am the resurrection and the life. And he goes on to say, though a person die, yet shall they live. 
And he who believes and believes in me will never die. That's the everlasting life. So that's coming back to the fact that even if we lay this down, if we know Jesus, we're going to live forever and get a new one. And by the way, he does raise Lazarus from the dead. But Lazarus also eventually goes to the grave, just like everybody else. And like I say, there are no exceptions to that. It's appointed, the writer of Hebrews is going to say, it's appointed in the men to die once. After that comes judgment. And yet, that is not the end for those who believe in Jesus. In fact, it's, it, Paul says, it's so glorious in what I've seen that if I had my choice, he told the Philippians, I'd go there right now, but I need to stay here for a while for you. So apparently, for those, those of us who are gathered here and are listening, God still wants us to be here for a while but have the hope that know that we're going to live forever with, with him. So that's, that's one of those positive things. They will never see death. They're going to live forever. And then John, the next one I think is John 15. You abide in me and my words abide in you. You will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Now, I want to just look for that a minute about that word abide. And that means to dwell in, to be comfortable with, and, and, and all of that type of stuff. You abide in me and my words abide in you. We belong to Jesus and we have that fellowship with him. Then you will ask what you will and it shall be done. Oh good, I get the Harley and the 56 Chevy. When I go home, they'll be sitting there. But one of the things that that means is his words are going to make our desires right. If his word abides in us, then we're going to know what's the most important. And not only that, we'll have the witness of the Holy Spirit to have our desire of what it's supposed to be, what he wants it to be, and then there's that guarantee that he will do it. Now, it doesn't put a timeline on it. Sometimes it may take some time for that to happen. But with God, you know, as it, as it says, a, a day is a thousand years, a thousand years as a day, in his time frame, it will still happen because his word abides in us and what he wants to happen. And so if we ask, and that's one of those good promises, if we ask and desire it, he will make it happen. So now I want to go to some other things. And this is what I call some of those harder things to handle, but yet they're what Jesus said about this, you know, he's not a baby anymore. He's the Lord of Lords, King of Kings. So here are some other things he said. Not only you know, we talk about living forever and have our needs met and all that. Okay, then we go to, to this one in Mark. When he called the people to himself and the disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me. Now that's a decision everyone needs to make. Is Jesus worth it or not? That's a question we've got to ask. Do I want my sins forgiven and live forever? Do I want to live my own life? Do my own thing, even if it's a mess. I don't want to submit to him. So anyway, that's kind of the question. Whoever desires to come after me, and remember, he's the one who said, I'm the only way you can have life. Period. There are no alternatives. Uh, to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And you find this in the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And Jesus says, if you're going to come after me and have my life, here's what you've got to do. And it's very simply saying this, and it's the concept of repentance that's been a part of sharing the gospel and, and meetings all over the place. Repent. Uh, and John the Baptist said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is hand. And it is simply illustrated like this when we think about deny yourself or repentance. I'm headed in this direction. If I repent and deny myself, and I want to follow Jesus, and by the way, my direction for any person who lives, unless they accept Jesus as Savior, is to do my own thing. and want to be in control of my own life. But to deny myself is to turn around and say, no, I'm going to follow Jesus. And most of the time when that happens to a person, we realize the Spirit has helped us to understand I'm lost without Jesus. And the only way I'm ever going to really live or have life is to follow him. And so that's what I'm going to do. So it's denying ourself. It's the cross of submission. I'm going to go his way instead of mine. It's the cross of service. 
His is the cross of salvation, and only he can do that. We don't add anything to it. He's not saying somehow you've got to pay for your own salvation by taking up a cross. He's not saying that. He's the only one that can do that. But we can have the cross of service and then the cross of availability. Father, what do you want me to do? Jesus, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to think in this situation? How do you want me to, to deal with somebody that's impossible to deal with in my own, and I'd rather kill them than, than love them? Well, that's because we're going to follow Jesus and be available. That's those tough words. But understand that when we do that, that's what takes us into eternal life. That's what takes us into those promises. Then another one, and, and I could have taken most of this from the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that it, was, that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies. What? Bless those who curse you. But God, you, you don't understand where I work. And do good to those who hate you. But my, my neighbor did this. It was disgusting. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Now for me, all the toughest statements he ever made is that statement from the Sermon on the Mount. Because it's totally in opposition to what is natural inside of me. I want to get even. Or at least I want to make them pay. And particularly when you think of some of the horrible things that people do to other people, even if it hasn't happened to me. They don't deserve to live. And yet when I look at my own life, Apart from Jesus, I'm just as guilty, and I don't deserve to live either. But God's grace has been given so that I can turn from that to Jesus. And the reason Jesus is going to say this is because that's exactly what he does and did in order for us to be saved. No person on earth deserves eternal life because we have a sin nature. And we instantly, as we grow up, want to, I won't say instantly, but we learn to want to be in control of ourselves. And then Jesus goes on to describe even a thought can be evil as if you've already committed the crime. But anyway, this is, this is one of those tough, tough statements. Uh, that following Jesus is what it's all about. And one of the things that I always try to do at the beginning of years, read through the book of Acts. I got a late start this year, so I'm just now into chapter 6, 7, and 8. But chapter 7 is about the stoning of a, one of the seven who were chosen as the, the people in the church to carry out the ministry under the apostles. One of them is Stephen, and he is going to pay his life for following Christ. And not only that, he's going to live this out the way Jesus did on the cross. As they're stoning him to death, taking rocks and using them to kill him, he looks up and says, Father, do not lay this sin to their charge fulfilling what Jesus had just said there. And it means it's possible for us to do it, but not in ourselves. It takes his life living through us to be able to do that. Anyway, that's one of the, that's one of the tough things. And then I think I've got another one. 7, 12. Got to hurry this up so I can get done. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, notice it doesn't say whatever they do to you. but whatever you would like them to do for you. Do also to them, for this is the law 
and the prophets. Remember, Jesus basically said when he talked about the greatest of the commandments are only two, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And he doesn't say good neighbor. He just says your neighbor as yourself. So anyway, it, it, so this is another one of those ten tough statements that Jesus made that's not possible, probably unless we're living in his new life experience through us. Oh, I've got one more. I think it, this is in John. This is an interesting one for our culture and for me. Uh, do not lay for yourselves up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Western civilization culture has just been steeped in the acquisition of stuff. And yet so many people will tell you, particularly when you look at some of those who take their own life sometimes, it's not because they don't have stuff, it's because the stuff never satisfied. Yeah. Because they didn't look to Jesus. Now, Jesus is, is not saying it's not wrong to acquire things, but he talks about where your treasure is. And the word treasure there is the word we get the sorrows from. And it means a special, special thing. Where are our desires? Do I desire to have the Harley more than I have a desire to live for Jesus? Is it more important for me to be in the Word and be instructed by Him and listen to His Holy Spirit than it is for me to go out and run 10 miles that I don't can't do anymore anyway? And so it's just whatever that situation is for each individual, that's what needs to be accomplished in our own life so that we know that because Jesus is the only ultimate treasure, that's what I'm focused on. And yes, he does give us a lot of good stuff. But then our responsibility is, is there some way I can use it for the kingdom? And the Apostle Paul wrote Timothy in, in chapter 6 of the first letter. It's evident you brought nothing into this world. And it's evident you can take nothing out. And he's talking about death. And so he says, therefore, with food... And clothing. Be content. The Lord has spoken to me so much in this last year, you know, as store shelves went empty and now they're doing it again and whatever. But it's made me realize, and I've got I've got my tuna casserole and my veggies in, in my mixed vegetables in the bowl, so when I go home and get to have lunch eventually, I can put them in the microwave and be able to, to have my Sunday dinner. And Paul says, tells to Timothy. Understand who Jesus is and how big he is and that he is the only thing that matters. And if you've got food and clothing, be thankful. Be thankful. So anyway, just a few more of the good stuff and then we'll, we'll be ready to wrap it up. This is one of the most powerful ones and John is going to get to this and he's referred to it. The thief could not come and by the way, that's both the devil plus our sin nature and the sin nature around us when you to talk about the thief. But if you make it personally thing, it would be about the devil. And in, in the statement he's talking about here, he's talking about a shepherd and the sheep. But at any rate, he says, the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. And you know why God wants us to stop doing things sometimes? Because God knows that whatever that is that he's dealing with in us is going to hurt us and is going to harm us. It doesn't mean that he wants to take away something fun or joyous. It just means that he knows that if we don't put a stop to it so he is in control of it in our lives, it may ruin us. And so anyway, he says, the thief comes not to steal, to kill, to steal, kill, and destroy, but that's what he comes for. But I came that you may have life and have it more abundantly than you could ever think possible but it won't come from natural means it will come as a spiritual thing because Jesus is our Lord and Savior okay the next one peace I live with you if there's ever a thing in our life right now as a culture 
or as families or as a church family or individually, sometimes this may be one of the toughest. Peace, and this is what he's telling them, and this is that working down towards his crucifixion, if you put this in the context of John. They're walking, they're working their way to the garden where Jesus is going to be betrayed and he's eventually, just in a few hours, going to give his life. And he tells them, peace I leave with you, not as the world gives, and that's something we always need to remember. Sometimes we look for our peace in the wrong place. But the ultimate peace comes from Jesus. And by the way, there are aspects of that. There's peace with God, Romans chapter 5, verse 1. There's the peace of God in Philippians chapter 4, when we put all of our things before him with thanksgiving. But anyway, my peace I'll live with you, not as the world I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, nor let it be afraid. And I, if you ever get a chance, look at some of those people and voice all the martyrs and realize that in circumstances that would normally scare me to death, they are in them and they trust Jesus because they know the outcome, because they know Jesus, whether they live or die. Okay, the next one. These things I've spoken to you that in me, and, and this is right at that end of his being with the disciples, he's going to be betrayed just right after this. Uh, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have be of, uh, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer. Well, God, you don't understand the circumstances. Jesus does. Jesus does. And if he lives inside of us, he can help us to understand that and look through it. And as Louis Giglio says, I like the way he says it in his Passion Ministry series in one of his, one of his teachings, sometimes all we need to do as believers, we've got circumstances that we're looking at that are just maniacal. But he says, look above them just a little bit and see Jesus and relive and realize he did everything on the cross and rose from the grave to give me life. And nothing can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. That's the peace. That's the victory over the tribulation. Not the change of the circumstances. He's getting ready to be betrayed and die for our sin. And all of those apostles who were with him, except for maybe one, the Apostle John, and then some of them are added later, like Paul, were going to pay for the gospel with their lives. And yet, they know that it is worth it because Jesus has overcome the world. In fact, uh, the Apostle John is going to write, uh, uh, greater is he than it that is in you than he that is in the world. Uh, and live that way. Un understand, understand that. Uh, you are of God, little children, and greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Okay, let's look at one more, and then we're going to close. And this goes back into the final song we're going to sing today that Kevin picked out. And also, then, as we're leaving on this mission Sunday, and if you have an offering to give back there, but this is the thing that, that now that we have received his life, this is one of the things that we do. You are the, this is in the Sermon on the Mount, you are the light of the world, a city that is set on the hill cannot be hidden, nor do you, do you buy, a, buy a lamp and put it under a, a, a basket. In other words, what he's simply saying is you buy a light so you can turn it on and see where you're going. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. If you want to know where you're going, know me, and I will illuminate the path for you. But anyway, and, and, and it gives light to all over in the house. Let your light so shine before men. That's the light of Jesus. That they may see your good works. Doing all those things that Jesus said it's impossible, in the natural is impossible to do. Love your enemy, do good to those who persecute you, and all that kind of stuff. So they can see that and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And those stories back there, Voice of the Martyrs, are filled with instances where they would, if they were beaten, put in prison or whatever, where they would still testify of Jesus and some of those very same people who were responsible for 
beating them or even killing some of the members of their family or church get saved because in them they see the light shining and they want to know what they have. And that's what that last verse is about, is taking the light that is in us because Jesus says, I am the light of the world and we accept him as Savior by his Holy Spirit. He now lives inside of me, making it possible for me to do those hard, impossible things and so they can see the Father and hopefully come to him. Let our light shine. And our light is there because of Jesus inside of us. Not so they can see how great I am, because it wouldn't take long to realize that ain't true. Pardon me, Linda, I didn't mean to use the word ain't. Uh, that isn't true, but they will see Jesus shining through me. And guess what? He has given his Holy Spirit to make it possible for that to happen inside of every one of us to advance the gospel. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the gift of your Son. That you have given us life. That in Jesus we have forgiveness and we stand justified as if we had never sinned. Even if we've had a tough week things we've had to say, I'm sorry, Lord. We still stand in Jesus as though we had never sinned. And not only that, we have hope within us that nothing can separate us from the love of God and that you will give us the strength to face what is this week and not only that, to face it, but to do it in joy, to do it in peace, to do it in power, and to do it in hope because we know Jesus and he is our victory. We just thank you for that. Lord, we just pray that if anybody who is hearing has never, doesn't know Jesus as Savior, Lord, the Holy Spirit will work in their hearts and their lives and they will want to accept Jesus as Savior. Say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I give myself to you. I will follow you, Jesus. You are my Lord. We just thank you for that, Heavenly Father. May it happen. That miracles, signs, and wonders, people saved, healed, and filled with the Holy Spirit, will happen because we, collectively and individually, follow you, Lord Jesus. We just praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.